you know my story, right? Rise the fame from the pain to glory, right? What's happening? I'm Rob Perna Jr., also known as the Funky Star Child, lead guitar, vocals of the New Kings of Rhythm and Onyx and Honey, and representing the Look Around Music and Arts Festival here in Westchester, PA. Awesome, Rob. Well, tell me, uh, take me through right now. So right now we're sitting at the Corner Art Collective in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Walk about with me what this place means to you Yeah, as, as a starting point for this conversation. This is actually really cool, and it goes kind of way back and kind of new. So in Onyx and Honey, which is a relatively new project for me with uh, my girlfriend, Nikki DiGiorgio, uh, started as a duo during quarantine, started discovering that we like to make music together. It was one of the first times I've ever felt comfortable enough to like get involved in the writing process with somebody else because it's a vulnerable thing. And it's either, you know, I used to just write something and give out the parts and then it played that way and that was it. I didn't have a lot of give for like interpretation, but with Nikki, I'm totally cool with that. So right. it's a new thing for me. During the building up of this band and playing around town, we ran into Rob Teodoro. Uh, vending at um, maybe the first time was even at Turk's Head Music Festival in Westchester. And uh, we got to talking to him, got to know him well, had him involved with events that we were throwing. Nikki has been a big, she's the main reason why like Look Around is happening. She's the force behind all that. And she's a, a really good organizer. So um, in that spirit, brought Rob D. Teodoro on board for some of the events that we were doing. And he started vending. Then come around to right around when he's getting ready to open the shop. I was talking to him and he was telling me, yeah, I'm opening up the shop with this guy, uh, Josh Ruggieri. And I've known Josh Ruggieri since like ninth grade. Nice. So Josh Ruggieri used to sit in front of me during, I think, English class. And he had a sketchbook out all the time, just <laughs> pouring over the sketchbook with his dreads. And he was like, you know, back oh, then. I didn't, I didn't know yeah, he, had back he was like, you know, he was styling. You know, <laughs> we were both like individual in our styles. I used to wear like uh, like hip suits to school, like pretty much my entire high school career. And I was busy doing my music thing the whole time. And Josh was doing his art thing. And then seeing him grow over the years to be able to sustain the artist's life, which is not easy to do. Uh, so that was always a major point of respect and props for Josh. And then to hear that they were opening up a spot together here in Westchester, in what used to be known as sidetracks. I don't know if people call it that anymore, but it used to be considered kind of hood yep. back in the day. You wouldn't really, people would be like, oh, don't walk down there. I've been down here before, yeah. and then I'm recently coming back, and it's amazing. It's been like 10 plus years yeah. or so, but it's amazing what's happened in yeah. 10 plus years and how different it all looks. It's shifted, and uh, in a good way. You know, yeah. um, it seems like the neighborhoods are still natural and they still got their vibes, but you know, it's not like, you know, nobody's like scared to walk. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly it. I remember a few stumbling nights being in this neighborhood and yeah. you know, kind of questioning. This, yeah. is like, this is like the beginning of cell phones where you didn't, you know, it was the brick phone and you know, it was a track phone. I got a set of light yeah. and it wasn't working. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. You, but you used to have to like just like you know get lucky to get out of situations. There was no call in the way. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as we drove up that first time, me and my son, we drove down this road. I was like, oh, I've been here before. Yeah. Said, Anytime I say that, he looks at me like, oh yeah, dad, you're out there late night, right? <laughs> How old are you? My uh, 13, or about to be 14, about to be 13. Nice. Yeah, yeah. My son's about to turn 17. Nice. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. My daughter's 14, and uh, they're both in middle school and all that jazz. So they're they're um. Talk a little bit about like uh, so. This place is obviously becoming like a nucleus of, of everything that's going on. Are there other ones like this in the area, or is this pretty much not like this? Right. Like, this is a very open book. Kind yes. Of place. Like I personally was not really in tune with my. Uh, visual arts style until during quarantine basically okay, nice. also and jail yep i was locked up for almost five years and we can get it at some point um but like during that time i discovered that i was better than i thought at drawing and things so i was able to make some money in there drawing uh making cards for people all kinds of things let me just turn that off um but uh then coming out, there was no time for that. And then quarantine hit, and I started to get back in touch with my visual arts. And in that process, 
starting to get a little more confidence. It wasn't until they opened this spot up that I personally ever put like anything in a show. Wow. Like they're very accessible here yeah. to like beginner artists. I mean, and that's not to detract from what's going on. Like the art on these walls is amazing. Like anytime they do a show, but it's all levels of artists. Some people who've never showed before, some people who do it all the time. Yeah. And that was very neat to have a place that I felt like I could come in and display artwork because that's not, I don't consider myself a painter very much. I just visually represent the same kind of things that I represent musically. And like, you, when you draw with your art, yes, yeah, so are you a traditional black and white charcoal or how I mean, you? This would be this design. Like, I did this. Nice. Yeah. This started out as something I would draw on letters home. I think to my, my buddy Lou Brotman at one point, I sent a letter home to him and I used to take the time to detail the envelopes because it was cool to me that you could. You could just bomb out the whole envelope. And I would just try to personalize it to whoever I was writing with. And I had several people that I was writing with the entire time. And this would be one of the graphics that I came up with. It was a skull but with piano teeth. Then I got out and I ended up doing a piece with it where I made a 3D kind of sculpture of it with spray foam behind a drawing, tilted off of a thing, then carved out the skull. Oh, wow. Sold that to a good friend. That was per one of the first pieces of art I ever sold. Uh, to Doug Miles from uh, the Break Room, who will be playing at um, Work Around Festival. They just started Saturday. following us last night on right Instagram, on. so that's cool. Band. Nice. So Doug, one of the players in that band, owns the original piece. Then I had it. Then Nikki got stickers made for me with the design, and then it was easy from there to oh, yeah. get you, shirts made. Yeah, and people then, were digging that. Yeah. yeah, and I burned through like I sold like. Almost three hundred. <laughs> Nothing I've ever <laughs> done. <is> sold that <laughs> no album. <laughs> I don't know if that made people even hear my music. <laughs> but they rock your gear. Yeah, right, yeah, that's awesome, man. So when you were coming in here, and and let's think. Actually, let's go back to that. Yeah, let's go back to that right there. Yeah. Were you going when you were like high school? You were saying you were doing the band thing. Yeah. Were you uh, any point dabbling in the visual arts at that point at all, or? To the degree of um, everything in my life took a backseat to guitar playing. Okay. And still pretty much does, unfortunately, <laughs> to the detriment of my close <laughs> relations and loved ones. Uh, guitar has always been the thing that just gripped me. Like, I re when I realized I could do that well, it, there was no reason to ever do anything else to me. So, for the most part, everything dropped off. But I would still dabble in, like, making the posters like i used to cut out by hand and collage posters that were inspired by like 1950s and 60s rock and roll posters oh, and like blues like i was a blues nerd nice. for a long time nice. like in high school like i pretty much only listened to you like, were a blues nerd in high school <laughs> from age like 14 on i was like only listening to like 50s blues and like oh, God, blues. <laughs> more like the stuff that gripped me up my biggest influence at the time was like Turner. Okay, and nice. And like his like driving rhythm and blues with the horn sack yeah. and, and then like the barrel house piano just thumping and the guitar, like aggressive guitar, all that kind of stuff. Horns like really impressed me. And the idea of band leading, not only just being a player in a band, because I did that for a minute and it just never was the vibe for me. I had to take the reins and make it what I wanted to be. I didn't see a reason. That's awesome, man. But I would do like art for shows. Right, right. That so when you did or just specifically for your music shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah nobody else ever seeked out any of my art that but there's people with stuff on the walls now, so it's been pretty cool. Nice. So you grad or so you graduated college or high school. Yeah. What's the what's the band name and that you had then? So from tenth grade on I had a band called the New Kings of Rhythm, which I still have. Awesome. Oh wow. And uh the drummer Joe Buno and the trumpet player in that band, John Paul Jones, I've been making music with both of them since like I was about 15, 16. That's awesome. You guys are you guys are vibing on a yeah. different level. You guys aren't talking about it's over it's 30 different. years now for uh for the core group. And those two also play in Onyx and Hunt with oh, me. Cool. Nice. So that's a very strong rhythm section. And just like you said, there's an intuition that comes with that much time with somebody. You're flowing most of the time. And uh, 
still the other guys in the band, like the, the newest member of the New Kings of Rhythm. Both bands are at looking at the New Kings will be hitting around midnight inside portion of the festival. But um, it was always a horn band, and the sax player has also been playing with us for 20 something years. The uh, keyboard player has been with us 15 plus years, bass player 15 plus years. Um, we had we lost a member recently, well, like last year, Kevin Farrow, he was with us even for like at least 15 years at that point. Um, Meg's been singing with us probably since I got out of jail, so she's probably the newest band member. But it's nice. it's a lot of roots. So when you're when you're out of high school and this band's going on, where what what path are you on from a daily? You, you now school's out of your out of your mind for the daily, and now is it music full time or what's where yeah. you're at? I was fortunate to have uh, the opportunity to begin teaching guitar. Nice. Pretty much upon graduating from high school, so hadn't thought about it really. Took lessons a few times from some really great players. And then as I was pondering what my next move was going to be, like, was I going to go to college, maybe try to go to Berkeley, mm -hmm. music school thing, um, which is expensive. And my parents totally would have done that. Like, they supported every move. But it was like, it didn't seem like to do what I wanted to do, that it was necessary to have a degree in any form yeah. or fashion. I was already offered to go tour the world with Big Jack Johnson by then. So it's like, it didn't seem like I needed the educational part of it. Then my own teacher hit me up as I was just kind of thinking of what to do and said, Hey, Rob, you ever, uh, this was Harry Hess. He's, he's rest in peace. Harry Hess, he passed away, but he was like, you ever think about uh, teaching at all? And I was like, well, yeah, I would do that. I'm, and he's like, well, um, both of my parents within the last two months had strokes and I'm moving back home with my parents to take care of them. And, he was living in Wilmington, Delaware, teaching out of Wilmington, Delaware, but his parents lived in like Bluebell, PA. Okay. And so. That's a hype with all the yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So he's like, I'm moving back with my parents and I'm going to take care of them. And if you want to start teaching, I can give you 15 students right off the bat. <laughs> and I was like, sold. So I was driving to Wilmington teaching and it started around 15 kids and it got to be about like 25. Well, I say kids, but it was all ages always. And um, some of them, I've definitely gone, even from back then, gone, seen them go on to do really great things musically. And it became something else that I really was passionate about, teaching and sharing the knowledge that I was gathering. And uh, you don't normally hop into a schedule like that. Yeah, it's, it's usually something you have to hustle for. So it was handed to me and it grew from there. And by the time I was in my 20s, I was teaching like sometimes 40 students a week, which was kind of a burnout because yeah. I was also playing music at least four nights a week. Okay, yeah, yeah. Pretty much within the borough of Westchester. Yeah. It was a different... So you're running on both ends of the yeah, it, was, it was a different time back then as far as the amount of places. Yeah, what year are you at this point? So I graduated high school in 1997 yep. from Henderson High School. And um, in that... In that time around Westchester, even as a person under 21, there was enough places that I could go play. I started coming here in 03. Yeah. So I can, I can, that was, yeah. Uh, so you're around that time. Like they still had Vincent's. Yep. And I used to play there once a month with Glenn and Paul. And that's like, I was a kid still. And they were like, those guys are legendary. And Glenn still plays his ass off. He's one of the best drummers I've ever seen, let alone gotten to play with. Mm -hmm. And I uh, learned a lot from them. Um, was fronting like a basically a power trio with that guys in there without any rehearsals or anything. And they were like some of my best shows ever. So, yeah, we used to come up here for the shows, uh, the independent shows in the area. And then my cousin, my cousin was at Westchester and she would get us tickets when they would have like, they would start to get big bands at the gym there, but the kids didn't really know who it was. Huh. And I've seen like really big bands in that gym, yeah, like maybe wow. 30 kids. Oh, wow. Because it was like, oh, that's a school function. Nobody would right. go. My cousin was always like, and we'd, we'd go and get our cargo pants. I'd fill them with natty lights, and yeah. I'd just be sitting there, like, crushing the thing. Uh -huh. I remember seeing, like, OAR and all kinds of stuff with, like, 30, 40 Whoa, people in wild. the gym. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of when I was, so I said, like, I was a blues nerd. I became obsessed with the blues. But prior to that, like, I had such a wide array of music that I was introduced to through my parents. They just listened to cool yep. stuff and were accepting of 
anything me and my sister. Yeah, we're on the same page on that. Every genre. <laughs> so it was like, you know, I always had hip hop mm -hmm. as a common thread the whole time I was doing that. And also reggae and, you know, stuff like the Talking Heads and Steely nice. Dan and stuff like that. So, I mean, I always had this consciousness of other cool music. And in high school, at one point, this was ninth grade. So this is before I was in New Kings and before I ever really realized how big of a part in my life funk music was going to be. Okay. I went and saw at Haverford School, which is like not the college. It's like some yeah. other little thing. <laughs> and it's not big. And it was in their little auditorium. And they had Fred Wesley, Maceo Parker, Jabbo Starks, Fred Thomas, uh, I can't remember all of the members that were Jeez. there, but from the original JB. Right. And like, and it was a free show. And we were there. And I remember just being off the hook. And later, knowing what I know, it became even more legendary that I happened to go to that because I wasn't really, I knew who James Brown was, but I wasn't like sucked into that world. I wish I wore my James Brown shirt. Right now. <laughs> I know, it's uh, in the light. It's in the light. Two right, days which ago. one is it? It's, uh, it's like yellow and it's like feel the funk. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. So James, man, James was one that my mom couldn't stand his voice. <laughs> <laughs> but like when I started getting into James Brown, like I was like imitating James Brown heavy. Like I could play oh, almost buddy. any James Brown song, and I could play almost any Parliament Funkadelic song. Oh, dude! So I didn't even know at that point in my life that all them horn players, the horny horns, JVs, were the same guys. I didn't know they played with people. So I, know, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. All of Parliament Funkadelic's horn section is the old James Brown horn section. <laughs> They got brought on board through Bootsy when okay. Bootsy joined up with Funk Adele because he had already played with James Brown. So there are certain Parliament records that are all members of the JVs. That's wild. Yeah, and there's wild. two or three solo Horny Horns albums that are some of the funkiest shit you will ever hear. They're like better than some Parliament albums as well. Anyway, so like that I didn't even know, but you're talking about the access yeah. to those things. Not everybody gets those shows, but the, the people that are there. I know having such that. I remember seeing, and even seeing in that time from a, I don't know when it was, but at some point when I was in, the, I can remember the house I was in in West Philly, in a two year period of time, we went to some warehouse and saw P Funk. Yeah. And that was nuts. Yeah. I didn't even know what the venue was. And yeah. we were there and it was packed to the gills. Yeah. Everybody was sweating. We we're all drinking, smoking, yeah. doing everything. And it was a wild warehouse. They were, it was an undisclosed yeah, location. They show. were those shows in like the late 90s and the early 2000s. And well, of them were pretty dope for and it was those those that are alive now. Yeah, it was cool. Because like people did get to see them in the seventies and even the eighties, where it was like next level funky. And then like that nineties, two thousands version of it is like kind of watered down, was but awesome. but it was so awesome. Like just like still awesome. The musicianship was crazy. Yeah. And the amount of guys vibing. As soon as PCU yeah, with release, I feel like it got it got oh, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> That was like a, a big thing for them to be able to like. That was like another second win for them. Oh, to be on that movie, yeah. yeah, oh yeah. That was like a good. That was a good, good thing for them. It introduced them to a lot. I yeah. remember watching that movie and watching that movie, knowing who they were, but no one else that I was watching right. the movie knew who they were. <laughs> I'm that guy too. Well, he's people. Like I love how George Clinton shows up in Good Murder. He's like yeah. in the insane asylum. <laughs> And then I'm just like, that's George Clinton. That's all I care about right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's dude, 80 yeah. something years old right now. And he just played uh, right before COVID or right after COVID down in New York. He played yeah. a street fair. Yeah. And I saw the footage of it. I wanted to go, but I was out of town. Yeah. And I'm like, he's still killing it. It's wild. It's like, not as much energetic, but he's still killing it. It's, a, it's, it's not a good advertisement for those who warn you against drugs. <laughs> 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 He's one of the ones that's winning. Him yeah. and like Keith Richards somehow. I don't know. He right? took those, uh, those eggs they put in the frying pan when we were kids. Yeah. Oh, oh, and he put them yeah. out of it. That's a wild one, man. Oh, he's definitely on the world to have that force about him. I don't know. Like, that's dude. awesome, dude. So, yeah, we're kindred spirits. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up, my grandfather was a DJ in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Oh, cool. He was poor as a church mouse, dude. He used to get a, he had a rolling cart, and he had his DJ equipment, and he would roll to the school with his records and all that stuff and yeah, set them up and yeah. play. Oh, and man. I grew up, so I grew up with uh, his basement full 
of every CD, record, album, and he was in the movies. Yeah. So he had every VHS with the three movies on it. Oh, he, yeah. he recorded it when it was on Homebox. Like, yeah. like Homebox was going away. Yeah. It was like right. HBO was going to be back yeah. up the next day. He recorded it. Wow. Yeah, and, like uh, drove right there. That's why we, and like, so, uh, so when I talk to people like you, I get real fucking excited because not a lot of people understand that diversity of the genres and really being able to sit down and like, I'll sit down and drive people crazy if I'm right because I'll just flip through the yeah. radio stations like, why are you flipping through the radio? I'm like, because yeah. I don't care. I listen to everything. I'm yeah. just looking for a good song. You right, know? yeah. Like, it doesn't that need to be my serious station. It needs that, to be whatever. The tie-in of HBO. <laughs> <laughs> and thinking about like funk music and just stuff that I like gravitated towards, like HBO was always right there too. Yeah, home box songs makes me want to make a song like where instead of I want my MTV, like I want my HBO. Just, oh man, <laughs> I know, the old school. Coming in the city, it's like a mile. Yeah, yeah. When you hear that sound, exciting. Those tones, yeah. you knew the, the show was coming on. Yeah, dude. And what kids don't remember yeah. today is because you just push play and it's on. Yeah. We had sensory alerts. Yes. And we knew. Yep. And it was like, wow, you know, yeah, they didn't think about that. The kids don't experience yeah. that today. And they, here's another weird thing. Yeah, that, that is. Right when you go into, uh, and then we roll right into the Sopranos. Yeah. Or you know, yeah. whatever else the, yeah. uh, the static would go across. Shit, yeah. from Fraggle Rock. So the Sopranos to Oz, they, they all be able to dream on. <laughs> I was talking with uh, my partner at Cal Bunga Johnny. Yeah. I think you met with him before. And we were talking about like today how everybody streams everything in different platforms and everybody's mm-hmm. watching things separately. And I firmly believe, this is like my hypothesis, is when we broke away from the unified showtimes of media is when society began to implode yeah because we didn't have shared experiences anymore yeah and then i feel like once that happened then COVID happened and then that further imploded that separation and isolation because think about it the days of like oh did you see that on tv last night yeah. no but I, I watched the recording later right that was always like if you didn't see it you were watching it that night or that weekend yeah like, but today you might get you might never end up seeing it and exactly because it's like well i got 17 other thousand shows i'm watching yeah or whatever else it's, it's like wild. Yeah, you don't have that Monday morning uh, huddle around the water cooler to talk about the uh, shows you watched or the videos in the weekend. You know? yeah. Now it's everybody's true. watching different things, so we're all on different frequencies. And then even, like, say if I want to catch up on something, then I end up looking it up, and then I'm basically just looking at a bunch of other people's opinions about it or AI's <laughs> interpretation of what happened. It's wild. And days. then you might have caught an ad yeah. while you were looking at it for something else that's yeah. more interesting than your watch in the first man. place. <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting world, man. And you're right, that quarantine stuff was like, I, it, I don't know. I think there's going to be long standing repercussions for some of these children that grew up in the that's, midst of that. So that's how something's going to shape. What's interesting is I'm actually interested to see what kind of art forms have come out of it and then eventually gain scale. Right. Because you know somebody created some new medium while they were alive. Oh, up. yeah. And, and there's a great song sitting somewhere in a, in a, in a, in a somewhere too. Yeah, the makers in general too. Like think people were realizing, and I'm talking on all levels, like culinary yep. skills. Like there's people that never bothered to cook before. Yeah, right now. I, like, hey, I love cooking. Like, yeah, it's it's wild. And it, it was interesting. Some people definitely, um, you know, Nikki and I have joked about it, and a couple other people I know joked about it to some regard about having been. Like personally, I was in prison until May 2018. So it wasn't long after that 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 all happened. And I think part of me was a little more ready for the isolation from having been locked up. And I wanna like talk to me about from high school to to prison, where we're looking back in reflection, kind of what are some of the what are some of the the uh, puzzle pieces that came together that led there? Well Unintentionally. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, definitely. It was very interesting. Like, so I, once I hit 21, um, within like a, a year or two, I think I got, uh, I got a DUI one time going home. I lived in Coatesville at the time and driving home to Coatesville from Westchester. I don't even think it was a gig scenario. Um, at that point, but whatever it was, I, I ended up getting two alcohol DUIs within like a year or something. Oh, that's where they jumped out on you. Yeah. And I got sent to 
uh, Lancaster County Jail yep. for uh, one month and then two months of house arrest and then like a year suspension and then had the um, blow to go oh, yeah, interlock and got all of that done by the age of whatever 23 or something I, I wouldn't know specifically without looking at the calendars that's long behind me but at that point in time honestly while i had the ignition interlock in my car even i was able to figure out what i could drink at a gig and, <laughs> and still be able to start my car that was it so mine was i had mine recently or in the past like five years or five years ago yeah. exactly so the technology was very advanced yeah was it i remember growing up oh it, it was, was like a, yeah it was like a big box it didn't always work i remember growing up my uncle had one yeah. and he would have he would be partying and tearing one on and then he yeah. would be like he would find somebody at the party that wasn't drinking oh, to go man. start his car that's a risky it. game yeah. that was uh that yeah. mine had a mine had a camera on it yeah they seen they do that now they didn't need to do that anymore no either. but like so whatever i mean i i did what i had to do but i didn't stop drinking i uh I just think I learned. I mean, it is what it is. I learned what I could drink yep. and not be over the limit. Like, yeah, no, like, you, no you, couldn't, you couldn't start your car if you had above a 0.02 yeah. alcohol. It was real sensitive, too. Yeah, like really? there was one time where it actually was falsely triggered when I was trying to go to work one day. And I legitimately was like, what the frick is going on? I was sober, locked up in, in uh, Virginia. Locked at a stoplight. Yeah, it just not function. <laughs> they, they said that it legitimately could have been if I ate pizza. Yes, the cheese. That there would have been yeast from the dough in your mouth that makes it. That's what they told me. Mouthwash, even would I understand yep. that? But so they told me the pizza I ate. So I'm like, whoa. But that being said, like, so I would go to a gig, and legitimately, I knew that I was there for five hours. So I knew technically I could drink five drinks and be sober by the end of the night if i drank the drinks at the beginning of the gig <laughs> so i did sit in reverse for a minute where i was getting hammered before the first set <laughs> Poor Bro, the picture of the straw. i mean like i would be like shot beer shot shot get on stage rock the house for three hours go start my car and be good to go yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm sweating all like, night. Like I mean, I sweat like a hog. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm like Michael Jordan on the guitar. <laughs> thing. Like it's like it's bad. It's like geysers. But so anyway, it's I'm uh, not promoting that. No, no, that's no. Everybody I mean. is listening. We're telling yeah. you from the back end. I'm, I'm just going through this. I'm keeping it real because that's what I do. But like, on the other side, I did. so then I didn't think I was ever going to have any problems with. We're the actually law. showing you how dumb it is. Yeah. That's what. <laughs> I mean, there's a dumb way. Um, yeah, so I just, at that point in my life, I did not expect any future problems with law enforcement. So, by oh, so you were never, yeah, you weren't one that was pushing the on. No, I right. was, after yeah. that, like, you know, I, I was careful. Uh, um, I drank less. Um, I've only had a, a few periods of time in my life where I don't drink at all. Um, but, like, I just know my limits. I grew up, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I never thought it was going to be a problem. And then in 2010, I was leaving a gig in Westchester and I was supposed to meet up with somebody after the gig. So I hung around after the gig until they were done working and I was going to stop through there. And while I was hanging out, in my car waiting i fell asleep and i didn't think anything of it i wasn't even i, I probably didn't even i think maybe i had one or two drinks yeah, that night. no i no. didn't even this wasn't so then i'm like i woke up past the time okay. yeah. then i would have been i was like damn i missed them i'll just go home for the night um start my car start going home this is by like now at this point probably three in the morning or something and i was done that gig at like 11 o'clock at night and i had two drinks i think so whatever i leave to go home it starts snowing and i'm just driving very cautiously down 322 and then i notice a cop behind me and i don't honestly think anything right. of it i'm like all right well you know, you know it's cool at least if i spin out or something there's cops here you know what i mean like <laughs> so i'm just cautiously driving and then the next thing i know their lights are on and i'm just like what? you know i'm like okay whatever you know so then i'm like looking for somewhere to pull over and i'm like I'm not pulling over here it's snowy icy road right right it's not safe so i went for a little while pulled over 
when I pulled over, they asked me if I'd been drinking, and I was like, I had two drinks earlier this evening. You know, I was like, uh, before eleven o'clock. You know, I'm like, I'm good. I'm just tired going home from my gig. Uh, they're like, all right, would you mind doing a sobriety check? And I'm like, not at all, officer. Uh, gladly. So step out of the car, blow the thing. Um, no, no alcohol. So right. no problem. Uh, I'm like, cool. And they're like, well, your eyes look a little red. Like, uh, we want to take your blood. And I have been the same story. Yeah, I have been a marijuana smoker for most of my life. I was 48 hours back from Denver. Yeah. (laughs) I was in a place where I could legally do it, right? In my system. That's wild. Yeah, like that's crazy (laughs) to me. So so I'm like, all right, you know, and they're like, well, we're going to take your blood. And I'm like, all right. Like, I know you could could get a marijuana DUI. I knew that was a thing. At that point in time, in 2010, I personally didn't know anybody who had gotten one, uh, personally. So four kids in my class. Yeah, four yeah. in my class. All right. So like I got the job and and granted now I'm 30 years old at that point. Well, so like I was born in 78, 88, 98, 08, 32 years old. We're the same age. Yeah. 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 So I'm 32 years old. I get pulled over and I'm thinking, all right, well, it's been a minute since my alcohol DUIs and I haven't had any problems. And I just didn't realize a marijuana alcohol, I mean, a marijuana DUI is equivalent to a third tier alcohol DUI as far as the punishment scope. And I don't know if that's exactly the same anymore because this is years ago. But this happens. I'm fighting it because I'm like, what is the reason for being pulled over? They oh, said I, I was driving out. too slow. I said I said waive it and I'll yeah. take the year suspension right. and I'll do. I don't want the. Yeah. I don't want the what it leads to. Well, yeah. yeah. So I mean, and and I was told I was dumb for doing yeah. what I did too. Well, yeah, it never. None of it works. You don't ever know. You know, nobody knows, and most people take pleas anyway. So <laughs> it's 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 a wild world. They kind of depend on that. Yeah. But so you know, go about my business. I should have stopped smoking weed. I did it. Uh, and very shortly after that, I got pulled over again. And this time it was for, that time it was legit for speeding. But this was, so I had preemptively stopped smoking and was going to drug and alcohol classes preemptively before going to court or anything. Stopped smoking weed for probably half a year. And then our dog died. And I remember specifically being like with my ex at the time, like we were like gonna walk where we used to walk the dog and we smoked the joint. And I'm not thinking anything of it. I'm like, whatever, I'm smoking the joint, I'm not being tested or anything. And then like it was like a week later, I did get pulled over for speeding that time. Yeah. At a reasonable hour, not drinking or anything. And it was a cop who recognized me. And immediately his partner was like he's fine like yeah and he had a bone to scoop at him and he's like oh no we're gonna take his blood and he's like like it was all like good cop bad cop scenario and i'm just sitting there like dude this guy honestly this happened because i had helped the person probably shouldn't have but i helped the person get away from the scene of an accident and so that they wouldn't get in trouble and that's where the cop recognized mm-hmm. me from because they saw they tried to say that I was involved in that, but like they didn't have any proof on it. But the cop recognized me from it because they did question me about it. And that was why I was in that position. And then I had to go and get my blood taken again. Got a second marijuana DUI within a year. Then I honestly got a bit of a case of the fuckets for a minute because yep. I knew I was going to jail already yep. and I just was in like a downward spiral. It was a bad, bad time. There were other personal things going on at the time relationship wise that were just like horrendous and it, it just wasn't working and life just seemed granted music never stopped. The, the music always was flat. Like everything seemed to be, I never had a problem getting work or playing games like that was happening full speed right, right. during all of this. We even got invited to play the Memphis uh, International Blues Competition with my band because we were that year, which you have to be, you have to, you can't just go play at it. Yeah. You have to win a battle to get to it. And it's a giant battle. There's 240 bands from around the world that go every year to Memphis. And it was a big deal for uh, my career at the time. And like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to Memphis. So like, I kept delaying the court 
proceedings yeah. so that I could do that trip. Yep. I was like, there's no way I'm missing that. Right. I already knew I was going to jail. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. And that's what's there for you. Know what I mean, like, the, yeah. the system, uh, the yeah. system I, is this. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen after I go to jail. And I don't know what's going to happen in jail. Yeah. So, right. Uh, and that put that in more perspective a little bit later in the story. But you're absolutely right. Because at one point, you're like, wow, I might not ever come up. You, you, there's just that real moment where they ask you where you want your remains set. When you go to state prison, they're like, "Where do you want your remains set?" And you're like, "I'm sure it's partially to like scare the crap out of you." But it's also, also legit. Play. And you're also there, yeah. so it's already the scared thing didn't work. Like, you know, so then, like in that moment of time, I ended up getting pulled over again two more times, and uh, both of those times, same story. I just knew, you know, what it was hidden for. I just refused to test. In general, and like fuck it, it's, it is what it is, fuck it. Right. So then, even then, I was being kind of advised by a lawyer that I picked up at that time um, that they were gonna. Even the DA was saying like he was shooting for four years, and my lawyer was saying we're good buddies, so I'm sure that you're gonna walk out of there with like two years, blah blah blah. And I'm like, all right, whatever. And I'm like, but. Don't sit here and tell me how much buddy buddy you are. Right, kind of, shit, yeah. Dude, they decimated my character in that courtroom. Like, I don't even think they knew it was weed related at first. They literally, like the judge, Judge Gavin, this guy was horrible, was standing up there. When you put that liquor to your mouth and got behind the wheel, you could have killed. And I'm like, does this guy even know? What? Like, I don't know if it matters to anybody. It matters to me. I know I wasn't out here. Ready to kill anybody smoking weed. <laughs> uh, just, I, there's nothing that anybody can tell me. I don't know, whatever. You're, you're fine. So, like, you know, I'm just saying, this guy's up here, and I'm like, dude, like, to my lawyer, like, can we, like, make sure that if I'm going to jail, I'm going right, to jail? Yeah, for the right reasons. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, Rob, right. God, I don't give a, like, fuck, whatever. I have weed charges. It does not bother me. You know what I mean? Like, and also, the weed charges never disturbed anything uh, in teaching. The amount of my students' parents and things that wrote letters to the judge to like people during this time reached out and came to me on so many levels as a help and a friend, and the love was so evident. And people really tried everything in their power to help in this moment, a time when I was facing incarceration and just doing whatever they could to make sure that didn't happen. And I don't think they liked that very much, honestly. There were like 40 plus letters that they received from people, and some of them were pretty like important people and whatnot. Being like, dude, this guy is clearly like, you know, he maybe he needs help, you know, but like, I don't think he needs to go to prison right. for like, because at this point in time, they're asking for four years. Now I go in, and during this melee, the, my lawyer's like, well, I'm not. I just let him think what he wants. I guarantee you he's drank wine before, but he definitely never smoked weed before. I'm like, all right, whatever. Sitting there listening to this, and then reach out to the right. They're like, clearly you're not amenable to treatment. <laughs> and like me and my family are there like, amenable to treatment? It was never even offered. Like You, you have know, to start to not be. Yeah, in. like what? I'm like, I'm going to, if you want me to go to fucking rehab, I'll go to rehab, whatever, dude. Like, yeah. You know, I don't know if I need to go from zero to 100. Like, it was wild. So then in this thinking I'm getting around four years and whatnot, the judge is like seven to 14 years, blah, blah, blah. And at that, and I'm like, whoa, dude. Yeah. My bowels were like liquefied, dude. Like, the, the bailiff was like, dude. Like, <laughs> he, like yeah, he, he was like, bro. Because they like – the this whole guy, journey, like Puritan, like, yeah. the whole journey. There was people within the system that I met that wanted to help people, and that were like talking to me like a human, and and heard my voice, and understood that like what I was going through, and like could see that it was like a weird crusade from some angle, and like were very polite about it in most cases, and tried to help, and like this like people were just like what like the courtroom was like what like there was a guy in court that day who punched a child who was two in the chest and like dislocated their sternum 
it was like his stepchild and he got like a two-year sentence or something oh my God. and it was like and i got seven to 14 years and then like i'm like go back to county and like i'm sitting there thinking about that and like what is the next step and like you can appeal it and i appealed it i damn well appealed it and in the process in the appellate process like i guess that's about me i wrote a two and a half page legal letter on yellow paper from prison to the judge about the exact nature of my crimes and by the first time he really understood him tried to be articulate and not come off as a like yeah. a snot because they were trying to like act like i just had no kind of like moral like like i wasn't like able to learn from it or something you know what i mean and like like i was spoiled and i have been spoiled in the regard that like i've never had the want for anything uh my parents made sure that like i could pursue my art from a young age and my sister as well and they were always very supportive of that and like also i worked hard like i know it was on hard times you know what i mean and it was like I, I had a nice position in society in the cool way that I wanted to be. And also as like an educator and, and looked up to in that regard. And um, like, it was wild. And then, so like I wrote this because I've never been shy about it. I, I, I mean, I knew it was illegal then. <laughs> right. yeah, but, but like I didn't. Which is a big irony. Yeah. Okay. But like, I never was judged on it you know what i mean like by anybody around me you know what i mean like if you don't like smoking weed then you just don't smoke weed if you don't hang out with people that don't smoke weed or people that smoke weed whatever there's all kinds of levels to that it, or you could say like i'm not a person who's like right. blowing weed in people's faces that don't like right. parts of it either you know never have i been well now in today's world what's even more ironic is those of us who have whatever gone through some sort of thing with whatever it may be of whatever scale yeah. and then like to be like sitting in the world today and like watching people consume it and like outwardly be like, oh, this is amazing. It's like, we told you that. People's the whole moms time. and dads always said that. That used to right. yell at their kids about it yeah. are now eating gummies with reckless abandon <laughs> and getting behind the wheel. <laughs> no, but uh, I see you. So, <laughs> but uh, you you're probably you. driving the bus. You're driving the van. Yeah. Bye, all but, the gummies. <laughs> like, so. I wrote this and like, I'm not dumb, but uh, you know, like, so I, I wrote it in a way where, you know, I researched something and I did have some points in there that maybe he didn't want to hear either because I was like, look, in my line of work, this is not a detriment to what I do. This is not something within my society that is a problem. Yes, I understand I should not be impaired in driving and it won't happen again and blah, blah, blah. And my lawyer was like, absolutely, you're not reading this to the judge. Yeah. And I'm like, absolutely, if they're taking seven years at yeah. least of my life at the age of, th by now it's 34. Yeah, you get two ages. I'm like, I'm saying whatever, I, it might be the dumbest thing ever, I don't know. But I'm saying what I have to say because it's not going to, not going to tack on three more years. Yeah. You know, like, but they could do that once I'm in there, you right. know, so I wrote and read at the appeal what i had to say which i have somewhere i can find it if anybody ever wants to read it you can hit me up but they uh he ended up reducing my sentence to five and a half to 11 years graciously and then with the there's not good time per se in pa anymore they call it something else yeah but with not having any problems within the system which i want to just go on to say that anybody you know who's in the system who is not getting in trouble in the system is doing a miraculous job. It's really set up to fail once you're in there. I don't know how I did it because I do have a big opinion and a big mouth sometimes. And I very much believe in who I am and I will speak my mind. And it did get me into a couple, um, what should I say? I don't want to say administrative, but like there were a couple people in the system there that once I was in the TC program, for instance, and was talking about weed the way I do, they were alarmed. And meanwhile, this is as it's become, because this is towards the end of my sentence, and I've already proved that I can do the whole thing and never be a problem to anybody. Wrote like 400 songs, taught like 50 inmates how to play guitar, organized bands, 
did first time concerts in there for things that I still have an open invite to go play there from the warden who understood and respected me very much so and saying he was a good guy, he was trying to do good things. We would do a rotating artist section. Yeah, like I mean it could be like I this I was about to organize going in to play for the population where I was at, which was Cole Township. Yeah. Um right when COVID hit. And then they had been on lockdown the entire time with nothing, but I can still call him up and make something happen. Yeah, everyone to do that needs yeah. some, need some way extra labor. I'm down cool. with that. Do cool. something. I've been wanting to do that. There's guys in there that I jammed with that are never getting out. Yeah. That, yeah. And not just from a cool factor, just a, honestly, just a people, I mean, yeah, there's some sort of break and feel like a human. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It might be like, you know, somebody's here and, and that's that's all it is. You yeah. don't have to, that's all it means. It's just like that break and feel like a human being. Yeah, dude. And like, if some of those people heard, like where I was at specifically, heard some of the music that we're releasing with Onyx and Honey right now, each of the albums we've done have songs that I wrote while I was there that I like orchestrated and taught to like multiple inmates. And like on this weird small scale of a 2,000 people population, mm-hmm. The, the whole population knew my songs. Like, it was like wow. people would spin the track, be like, yo, pick out that jam loud. They'd be like, yeah, I do And then, like, you know, people would be like singing along. Like, it was wild. So, it'd be cool to bring it in in after that's having bad. it that's made badass. it work out here. But you're good, you're good Giant. So, yeah. as that's happening and all, like, you know, that's like, it's a long tail. I don't even know what time we're at. How you doing? Okay, so, we'll, um, we'll wrap it up here. Yeah, yeah. cool. Give, uh, give everybody the, your handles on social media yes. and your everything on yeah. the website. Yep. Yeah. So it's Funky Star Child 78 on Instagram, Rob Perna Jr. Uh, also on Facebook, reach out, check it out. Also on YouTube channel, Rob Perna Jr. Onyx and Honey Music.com for everything Onyx and Honey related. Uh, the New Kings of Rhythm on Instagram for all New Kings of Rhythm related stuff. There's also a New Kings of Rhythm Facebook page. Look Around Music and Arts Festival, which we're representing hard uh, with Nikki, who is the force behind all that. We're just here to put it all together, make it happen for the whole community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thanks. Nate. Thanks. Beautiful Thanks. talk. That was awesome. You know my story, right? Rise the fame from the pain to glory, right? <laughs> 